so uh, maybe last last year, uh, I was considering buying a gun and learning to use it um, for protection purposes or or you know knowing how to defend myself. And I went back and forth quite a lot uh, of like, well, I don't really want a future where there's guns. Like I, I don't feel, I feel like if nobody had guns, I would be happy with that. Um, and that it's, it's uh, operating at a certain level of consciousness of, of um, you know, guns are essentially, you know, just a forceful way of like trying to get what you want in, in some ways. And so, so I ultimately didn't, uh didn't get a gun although i think i probably would have learned uh, enjoyed you know just learning to shoot it as a skill like i, I like archery um so maybe you could comment on you know i would i would love for humanity to sort of transcend to a level where it's like fighting and guns and violence are just kind of like remember when we used to do that 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 thing that we thought we had to do in order to get along um how do you how do you see we can move from where we are to to a future where I don't know perhaps fighting is only done for enjoyment but not for well you know I'm I'm not really one of those that thinks on that level for example when you say humanity you know I think of the incredible differences in cultures and people's histories and societies and so forth and so try to bring all seven plus billion people on a path it sounds it sounds I, uh, you know, I'll apologize. It just sounds like not not the best use of my time to try to think about how to harness seven billion people together to one cause that I like. Mm. Uh, so I, re I I prefer to think much more specifically. If we want to talk about gun violence, then we can talk about gun violence in America, which is very different from gun violence in Mexico uh, or gun violence in the Ukraine right now. So whenever you bring up a problem. I like to define the problem as specifically as possible, spend a lot of time on defining the problem, which, which most people don't do because they, they, want, they quickly want to get to their pet solution without doing the heavy lifting of defining the problem. And then understanding what exact approaches will address different aspects of the problem. So, and this is where I, I call it rationality is required which means whatever you're interested in, a mastery of the facts, including the facts of the human condition, a mastery of the issue that you're trying to address, a mastery of understanding how, you know, how we change people's thinking and behavior. So it's a very, very complex thing. So this is the kind of thing, whenever I get asked about this, I will spend a lot of time on getting definitions and understanding what works and doesn't work. And I don't think it's what you want to do today, but if you want to know my general answer, mm. I, like to, I like to address the possible, not the ideal. Meaning what is possible for me in my life, my community, where I can actually exert change. And I'll let other people be the futurists and think about you know, the ideal human condition. I, 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 my tendency is more to work with what is and move the needle just a little bit as much as I can, whatever influence I have. Which is why I'm so interested, by the way, in spiritual psychology, because I, in my work as a rabbi, I've heard many of my colleagues speak about fixing the world and changing the world and so forth. And at the same time, I'm witness to, um, People lost, people lonely in the midst of relationships, families falling apart, people making their lives and other people's lives much harder than they need to. So while someone's out trying to fix the world, I'm, I'm working on one person at a time, one family at a time, uh, helping people, lost people find their way. I'm not putting, I'm not saying people shouldn't be trying to address society's problems, but I've decided to focus on you know, a much smaller focus on individuals, relationships, families, et cetera. Gotcha, okay. Um, and so that's, so what I, what I heard about your approach to, let's say if we were going to talk about gun violence in America, that there's a lot of preparatory work 
to be done before you could have a fruitful conversation? Absolutely. For example, where does it happen? Who are the perpetrators? Who are the victims? What exactly kind of weapons are used and under what conditions? So there's a huge factual base that we have to establish. And what, one thing I've noticed is many of the solutions people offer are not the solutions to the actual problems. Uh, this, since it seems fairly timely and like perhaps in, in the minds of a lot of Americans, um, is this something that you, is, is gun violence in America something you, you spent time? Oh, I've thought about it a lot. And I think I probably have more expertise than most people from what I'm reading. I'm sorry to say most people just don't have a mastery of the basic facts and don't think rationally. I think people think with their emotions. So if anybody were to ask me, I, I, I would recommend a very factual, rational approach to come up with ideas that are very likely to reduce gun violence. Uh, what are some of the facts that, that people miss? Uh, that if you look at gun violence as a social issue, a disproportionate number of the perpetrators and the victims are uh, Blacks and Hispanics between about ages 14 and 30, mostly male, and mostly in uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged areas. So to try to address gun violence in rural Montana is different from addressing gun violence in Chicago, Baltimore, Los Angeles, or New York. It's just two different kinds of problems. Yeah, understood. Um... I used to live in Montana. <laughs> Everybody has guns in Montana. My first day. You have some of the highest gun, proportionally, some of the highest gun ownership in the country and some of the lowest gun violence in the country. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is not, you know, people say gun violence in America. I say, where? Which city? Which square blocks? Who's doing what to whom with what kind of weapon and what can we do to stop it? So you'll see that I, I like to drill down into the specifics and I try to, and by the way, I think about this with everything that I teach about, drill down to a mastery of the relevant facts and then come up with policies that address those facts. Yeah, so you, so breaking it down to a level where you can actually impact uh, sort of individuals and uh, so a small enough um, field of vision that would be effective. Um, right. I, was, I was chatting with uh, someone here in St. Louis. I live in St. Louis. We have a lot of, um, it's known for its homicide rate to some degree. Um, and I was chatting with someone who knows quite a lot of the politicians in the city. And he said, they don't really have the political will. They know how to stop it. Um, but they don't have the political will to sort of to to do it um, because they're afraid of being called racist. Um, Correct. Yeah, that's that, that's uh, that's tragic. And um, you, you know, there's like there's basically these two small neighborhoods where most of the murders happen. Um, Correct. And <laughs> not unusual. Yeah, it's just. So, so I, I mean, the, the upshot of it is that the whole city and perhaps the region is, is bypassed for investment or companies or sometimes people moving here. Um, so it's this, this and, and the story, right? The story of, oh, don't go to St. Louis, there's murders there, but, you know, it, it just, as long as you don't go to this block at night, you're probably fine. Mm -hmm. um, So then, when you have when you have a situation like that, like uh, what's what's the uh, how do you get something into momentum? Um, in, in my opinion, mm -hmm. first of all, it has to be a ten year plan, and not something like uh, you know whether a rifle has a pistol grip or not, which I think probably does not affect the gun violence in St. Louis. Um, I think there has to be an integration of um, uh, psychologists social workers, um, uh, police with uh, focus on de-escalation skills first, 
uh, work in families. Many people who are shooters come from, uh, live in dysfunctional families. So if we took an approach and looked at and they were suffused with social workers, psychologists, educational psychologists, uh, you know, to start the healing in families when kids are 10. So when they're 16, picking up a gun and shooting the opposite gang, because a lot of this, as you know, is gang and drug related and domestic violence. Well, I would say, let's start with 10 year olds. Now I'm not saying don't address everything else, but let's start with the mental, emotional and moral health of families when kids are still in the home mm -hmm. and, uh, and start to address things there, which I think needs an, a large number of psychologists and social workers. Yeah, yeah, my, I, I get the same feeling. Um, you know, in the circles that I travel in and, and getting to interview people, you know, I'm, I've encountered dozens of healing modalities uh, and, and there's like something there from, from all of them. And it's, as I look around the landscape of my city, you know, I see like, oh, there's so much healing in, on many levels that needs to happen, you know, like from uh, just like there's, more and more homeless uh folks and mm -hmm. uh, um, <clears throat> uh, mental health i mean this is one thing that distresses me the most is the um so much attention on you know for example whether a semi-automatic rifle has a pistol grip which if people think that'll solve gun violence i i hope it does but the problem is the government has limited attention. So if we would put the attention on mental health, and mental illness and emotional disturbance and helping people think better and regulate and manage emotions better and you know, see life as hopeful and with options for human actualization, human fulfillment. I mean, you know, and this is a very difficult thing and that's why I think it's easier to sound tough on crime than have actual solutions ab about um, you know, human alienation, mental illness, um, because the, 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 the attraction to violence out of human alienation is as old as the human condition. Yeah, I see that. And, and so, so in a 10 year plan, like what's, how do you get someone in the community to, to sort of want to participate in it? Like say you have some, some mental health workers and social workers that, that are available. Um, how do you get someone uh, or a family to, to say, oh, I want to take advantage of, of that? Well, that's a great question. You know, it takes me back when, when I teach my virtue, rationality, wisdom, which is the, 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 the main thing that I'm, I'm known for in my community and in my teaching is my uh, what I call wisdom work. Um, that was the focus of my Rich Roll podcast, uh, where I was a guest, and he he then I think told Aubrey to have me on, and Aubrey went and I went down the Kabbalah path, which was good, but it's not the main thing that I teach. Mm. The main thing I teach is number one virtue, which is restraint of harmful uh, you know actions and words, which of course comes down to violence, which is the uh, unrestrained negative emotionality that turns into words and verbal violence and oftentimes ultimately physical violence. So first virtue, rationality, how to think things well through without becoming, uh, without raging and saying and doing hurtful things. And I have a whole system that I teach. And many people say to me, I wish I would have learned this in school. My marriage would have gone better. I would have been a better parent. Everything in my life would have gone better if I would have learned virtue, rationality, and wisdom. Why don't they teach it? So I have a, you know, a lot of answers why they don't teach it, but, uh, but one answer is <laughs> if people aren't qualified to teach it. It's not in the curriculum. You don't learn it in educational programs. There aren't any classes in virtue, rationality, and wisdom. So you know, if you were to give me you know, free reigns over the educational system and all the budget that I wanted, again, it would take 10 years to create, to create really good teachers of virtue, rationality, and wisdom. And what it take a lot of is, for example, uh, when I would teach, uh, you know, my, my seventh grade Barbot Mitzvah class, we did a lot of role playing. 
Okay. We did role playing of, of somebody arguing and role playing of de-escalation. How to, how to de-escalate an argument, right? And so it's one thing I teach is de-escalation techniques. Um, so I think people learn de-escalation te techniques early and families learn it and children learn it. I think it creates a different culture in a family. So I'm, I'm very much interested in, you might say, changing the culture of conflict to, to de-escalation. And from my method, I teach virtue, which is the restraint of the negative. I mean, it's a very simple way to define virtue, but it's good enough to start with. Rationality, how to think through what's happening inside of you, what's happening with other people, which requires some degree of you know, observer mind and objective mind and so forth. And ultimately to wisdom, which is managing your own inner life. So I think if people are adept at virtue, rationality, and wisdom, there's a lot of choices to make before we get to violence. 